thank you for joining us online here at Fam Church for a message on hope. If you haven't already, please click the subscribe button below to subscribe to our YouTube channel and go out to Facebook at facebook.com slash famchurch. And now, our lead pastor, Brian Lane. I'm going to tell you my story of how I found hope. And my story begins in a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I grew up in a home. We weren't a church-going family, but it was your traditional Midwestern house. You know, we, my, both of my parents worked. Uh, they worked hard. You know, we had money, but we didn't really have money for extra things. If you were here for the message I did, talking about that pair of Nike sneakers I wanted. Uh, I couldn't get those because my parents just couldn't afford to get those shoes. But, but, you know, we had enough money to survive. You know, we had clothes on our back. We had food on the table. We had all of those things. And, and, and my only church experience really in that whole time was when I hit sixth grade. My mom had grown up as a Lutheran. And uh, she had been confirmed in the Lutheran church. And so, and so she wanted all of her kids to be confirmed in the Lutheran church just like she was, even though we weren't even really going to church at the time. And so she started taking us to a Lutheran church in our neighborhood to go through this confirmation process. And if you don't know what it is, it's kind of this, these classes where you, you come in and you sit down and they tell you all about the church, all about its doctrines, all about its beliefs. And you go through these three years of classes and then they, then they, then they do a big ceremony on a Sunday morning for you where they say, Behold, now you know everything there is to know about Jesus and the Bible and the church. Now you can never come back to church again, basically. I don't know. That's kind of how it was. And, and you know, they had this, it, there was a big ceremony with it. When I finally completed it and we did the confirmation at the start of our 10th grade year, um, it was kind of funny because we're doing this ceremony and they said, uh, okay, we need all of you guys to pick out your favorite Bible verse because we're going to read that as you walk to the front to receive your confirmation certificate. And we're like, Okay, well, literally, I had never opened the Bible, okay? I know I was going through these classes, and we had to read the Bible. I didn't pay attention to what I was reading. I didn't pay attention to what was going on there, okay? And so I come to this, and I'm like in a panic. I'm like, I've got to pick a po- favorite Bible ber- verse. How do I do this? Where do I get a Bible verse from? And so football saved my life. I was sitting there one Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon watching a a pro football game, and I saw this guy in the stands in the back of the end zone holding up a sign, and it said John 3.16 on it. And I said, what is that? And so I grabbed my Bible, and I opened it up, and I found John 3.16, and it said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever shall believes in him shall have eternal life. And I was like, that's it. That's my verse right there. And so I was really excited that football did that for me. No, that's not really what happened, okay? Okay. Now, it, it was kind of like that. So I get this, you know, I got to pick out this favorite verse. And so what do you do? You take the Bible and you fan its pages and you go like this, right? And then you see where your finger lands. And wherever your finger lands, that's your favorite verse. Well, that didn't work out too well for me. Because I was getting all kinds of crazy verses. I'm like, what am I going to do? So I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I can't figure out my favorite verse. And she just threw, hey, how about John 3.16? I read it. I said, that's it. That's my favorite verse. And I think most of the kids who were confirmed with me had the same struggles I did because that was most of the kids in my confirmations class. Favorite verse, John 3.16. But with this confirmation, it marks the end of my church and Jesus experience for a while. What happens after this was a crazy ride. Not as crazy as some of you, but it was enough for me. And it all started in eighth grade, in the spring of my eighth grade year, one of my friends who lived across the street from another one of my friends decided she was going to break into her dad's liquor cabinet and steal a bunch of alcohol. And so, and so she did that. She broke in. She stole it. And then one night we had a sleepover at another friend's house whose mom, she was a single mom. She was working a lot. She wasn't home much. And so we, we went over to their house. We had a sleepover. And like eight of us just started drinking all of this alcohol that she had, uh, that this other friend had stolen for us to drink. And, and so so we drank it, and, and that started a process, an eight-year run of me filling my life up with stuff like alcohol and marijuana to find joy, to find happiness, to find a completeness and a hope in my life. And it took my friends to, to places we never thought we would go. I mean, by the time I was 15, I was standing before the juvenile courts in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota, standing before a judge with an attorney having to explain to him why I was being charged with a felony. I had to spend the next couple of years on being, or next couple of years on probation 
And it was pretty tough because, you know, when you're fit, when I, w- I was like ready to live the crazy life and I found out that I couldn't quite live the crazy life. I needed to keep my sin under wraps, the things I was doing undercover because if I was found out, I was going to be in trouble. The judge told me, he said, look, buddy, if you ever come back into my courtroom again, there's going to be dire consequences for you. And I knew what those dire consequences were because about three miles from our house was the Ramsey County, that was the county we lived in, the Ramsey County Juvenile Detention Center. It was this massive facility with all of these dorm-style buildings with giant fences around it and razor wire on the top of it. And I could see that place on a regular basis. And I knew that what the judge was talking about, that that could be the place where I would end up. And so... It took my life into stealth mode. I worked hard to protect myself so I wouldn't end up there. I mean, sometimes when you're 15, you're not very good at stealth, okay? Uh, All high school students, you think you're great at hiding stuff, you're not, okay? Like, I remember one time, my sister comes to me, and and she, she, she brings her purse over to me, and she opens it up, and there was like three cans of this beer called red, uh, what was it, uh, I can't even remember what it was, but it was this really strong stuff that you could only buy in Wisconsin, and so we made a trip to Wisconsin to buy it. Anyways, I had dropped it in the back seat of the car, and my mom, or my dad, got in the car with my sister, and she jumped in the back seat, and she thought, saw these three cans of beer. She quickly scooped them up, stuffed them in her purse so that I wouldn't get caught and get in trouble for my parents for having alcohol, okay? I mean, that, that was just kind of how things went, but, you know, I, I, I went through high school. I didn't do very well in high school because I didn't care. I wasn't studying. I, I, wanted, I just wanted to party. That's all we did. We spend our weekends trying to find where it is we wanted to party. However, I was still able to graduate. Now, my desire was not to go on to college. That sounded like way too much work. Unfortunately, my parents didn't give me that option to not go to college. And so I enrolled at the University of Minnesota. And uh, when I was there, we did some really stupid things like our friends, my friends and I decided that, hey, you know, we need to make extra money. You know what the best way to make extra money is in college? You party. You have a giant party at your house, charge for cups, and make all kinds of money as the people come flowing in the door. Well, we get this idea, and our first party is absolutely the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life. Kids from all over campus, at that time, the University of Minnesota had 60,000 students enrolled in it. Okay, we had people show, the house was so full that you could barely move through it. There was five, 600 people inside of this house, easy. Okay, and so we said, you know, we gotta shut this thing down. So we shut the party down. Well, two guys show up and they're like, we wanna come in. We said, you can't come in, it's too full. And, and, and so they're like, okay, we'll see about that. So about 10 minutes later, they show up with guns and they start shooting the place up, okay? And so when you start shooting guns, guess what happens? The police show up, okay? And so the cops raided our party. It was just an absolute disaster, an absolute disaster. But that's how I was living my life. And I got really tired. I got really tired. My thought was that if this is what life is all about, if if pursuing this was the only thing that was going to provide meaning in life, that life indeed was meaningless. See, I didn't see the point in living anymore. There was no hope. There was no motivation to live. And, And all I had to look forward to was death. And it all came to a head on Christmas Day of one year. And I, I, was, I had a job, I was working at Perkins as an assistant manager, and Perkins was open on Christmas Day at that time, and I had to work, and so I went in and I worked my shift, and I got to say one thing, okay, if you go to a restaurant on Christmas Day, we need to talk. Dude, everybody, sh- we're like the only restaurant open for miles, everybody showed up. I mean, I was there for like 12 hours. I was supposed to be there eight. Non-stop people coming in. Christmas Day, dinner at Perkins. Come on, man. Don't do that. But I got off of work and I headed over to my parents' house. I'd missed Christmas dinner because I was at work. And um, so I wanted to uh, go over there and get my gifts, of course, because that's what you do on Christmas, right? And uh, I went over there And I was preoccupied the whole time I was there. I didn't stay very long because uh, a friend of mine had called me, and he said, man, I just got a new bag of weed. This stuff is good. Come over. And so I was thinking the whole time, I'm like, I got to get over to this guy's house. So I left my parents' house, cut my visit short, and I headed over to his house. I come in the door. He was in an apartment, and he had the light on in the kitchen, and the rest of the place was dark. So I walked into this dimly lit place. 
I sat down. We just started to smoke the rest of the night. And I remember driving home later that night, and I was just thinking to myself, what on earth am I doing? What are you doing? You gave up Christmas, spending time with your family, to sit with another guy who had burned all of the bridges in his life with his family because of drugs, and that's why he was sitting in his place home alone on Christmas Day, and that's what you wanted to do? Instead of, I was just like, I, I was just like, it messed me up. And so for the next several days, this really bothered me, and it consumed my thoughts and my thinking. And I was like, man, I've just got no hope. I've got no nothing. And, and we were coming up on New Year's Eve, and, and I knew what New Year's Eve meant. My friends were already ready to go. They were ready to head out and party. We were going to go bar hop, and we were going to do all of this stuff. And, and they were getting, you know, really excited. And I was sitting there thinking for a whole week, how do I get out of New Year's Eve? I mean, I just wasn't even motivated anymore to do that. I was tired, I was burned out, I needed my life to take a turn, I needed to go in a direction that had purpose, that had hope, and that had meaning. Well, I was working with this guy who was a Christian, and uh, he had been giving me these little pamphlets that tell stories about Jesus in it, and for some reason, I don't know why, but I had kept several of those and thrown them in my desk drawer, and so uh, one, that, that New Year's Eve, I was sitting there, and I'm like, well... I mean, what else? So I pulled this pamphlet out, and I just started reading it. And after I read the pamphlet, I prayed the prayer at the end and received Jesus into my life. I don't even know what the pamphlet said. I can't even tell you what the prayer was at the end of this thing. All I remember is that suddenly, in an instant, I was changed. Like, I went to work the next day. I walked in the door, and people looked at me. And this was no joke. I thought this was the craziest thing I'd ever experienced. I walk in the door, and people who I'd worked with for years looked at me and said, what, did you do something different today? I'm like, no, why? They said, you just look different. You look like a different person. I mean, that's what they were saying, and I was just blown away by that, because I'm like, how can, because I didn't really know what I was doing and praying the prayer at the end of that thing. But see, for the first time in my life, I had finally felt joy. I had finally felt purpose. I had finally felt hope deep in my life. Now I still had a lot of junk to go through because I had put a lot of junk on my life that I had to sort through. It wasn't like instantly everything got better and everything was wonderful. That's not what happened. I had to so I spent years sorting through stuff and getting stuff cleaned up. But you know what? Hope was restored. Jesus came and Jesus broke through and brought hope where there was no hope. And so if you are sitting in here this morning and you are saying, you know what, that kind of defines my life. That's kind of a picture of who I am. Can I tell you this morning that Jesus is here and that he can bring you hope? And in just a few minutes, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that. But before we get to that, my guess is there may be some of you sitting in here this morning and you're saying to yourselves, well, you know, that's awesome. That's a great story. I mean, I love the sound of that, but that doesn't really help me. You know, I've never really had struggles with the police. I've never had struggles with drugs. I've never been a heavy drinker. I've never really done anything. I've got a good life. I've got a good job. I've got a good family. I'm in a good spot. Everything is good. I mean, what does this say to me? Because I've got all the hope that I could want or need. And so this morning I want to turn uh, to John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, um, and if you don't know where John is, this is the section where my favorite Bible verse was found when I was getting confirmed, but, uh, um, you know, if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put it on the screen behind us, and if you're here this morning and you need a Bible, just stop by guests or, uh, Fam Connections after service, and they've got a brand new Bible for you that you can take with you as you leave here today, all right? And, uh, and uh, this is what it says uh, in John. Oh, wait, let's not read that first. Let me tell you a little bit about John, okay? This book was written by a guy named John. How about that? Named John called John. That's amazing. But he was not a religious dude, okay, his whole life. At one point, he was a fisherman. He spent his days out on the Sea of Galilee with nets, casting them into the sea and pulling fish up onto the shore and going into town with these loads of fish and selling them in the market. That was John's life. But then one day, this dude named Jesus shows up on the shore, and Jesus says, hey, buddy, I got something better for you. 
You know, you're here out here catching fish and bringing fish and selling them, but I want to do something greater. I want to do something better. I want to make you a fisher of men. And John heard those words, and immediately John just jumped up, and he went after Jesus and followed Jesus for the next three years. And, Je- I mean, Jesus' life was crazy. Okay, you want to see a crazy person? Just read the life of Jesus for those three years. I mean, that was a crazy, crazy situation. But John, he was kind of like, his circumstances were like that car commercial. Have you seen that car commercial where the father and son are sitting at the table talking, and the dad says, so, you bought a car, you quit your job, and now you're going to drive across the United States? And he says, yes. I mean, that's exactly what John signed up for. Jesus says, quit your job, come follow me, we're going to do some crazy stuff, you're going to see some crazy things, life is just going to be wild for a while. And then that's what John went through as he went and followed Jesus. And so most of the events in this book called John, John was actually at those events. And so this is what it says in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be bored when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And all the mothers said, amen, right? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. All right, so here we have this encounter with this man named Nicodemus, and I hope you're saying to yourself, who is Nicodemus? Uh, Nicodemus is what they called a Pharisee, okay? And uh, he was a Jewish religious leader who followed the rules and regulations of the Jewish law. They were also very politically active, they were well-educated, and they were very well-off financially, This meant that they had influence with the celebrities and the leaders of their day. This meant that their kids went to the best private schools. This meant that they had nice houses and they lived in the best part of town. It means that they had the things that no one else had and they got privileges that no one else got. And to top it off, he was part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. What the Sanhedrin did was they were the central judicial authority for all of the Jews. They administered the city of Jerusalem. They created the policies for religious instruction in the synagogues. Uh, They, uh, throughout the whole Roman Empire, they were in charge of making sure that the services were conducted right at the temple in Jerusalem. And finally, they administered justice in cases where the Roman Empire was not enforcing something, but Jewish law dictated something must be done. There were only 70 men who were a part of this council. And they were chosen from the leading priestly families of Israel. So these guys were the elite. These men lived a nice, an easy, a comfortable, a cushy life. They had no need of anything. They had all the hope they could possibly need because their life seemed to be a life of hope. They could take vacations where they wanted to. They could eat what they want. They had the best furniture. They lived a great life. 
And what we need to know is that this was not that common back 2,000 years ago. I mean, now we stand here in the United States and we look around and we can see a lot of people living that kind of life. But 2,000 years ago, this was not the common way that most people lived. It was not the norm for the Roman Empire, Judea, or Jerusalem. But here was Nicodemus. He had all of that stuff. He was living what we would call the American dream. But Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus. He comes to him in secret at night. Uh, Nicodemus, he had nothing to gain by going to Jesus. Absolutely nothing to gain. As a matter of fact, the man had all kinds of things to lose by going to Jesus. Because the, Jesus was hated by the Jewish ruling council. They did not like him. They wanted him dead. But he went there in the middle of the night in order to speak to him. But there are some of you in here today, and you're saying to yourself, you know what? I don't think Jesus has anything to offer me, just like Jesus had nothing to offer Nicodemus. And so I want to speak to that. Now, I know you're not risking your social standing or your job by being here, but Jesus still has something to say to you. And the first thing is this. No matter how much you have it all together, no matter how much your life seems to be together, it doesn't change the fact that every single person who has been born is sinful. Jesus, in his conversation with Nicodemus, never once confronted him on the sin he had in his life. But even though he never confronted him on the sin that was in his life, he still let him know that he had sin and that it was keeping him from God. If we looked at verses 13 and 14, he makes it clear. He says, no one has ever gone into heaven, meaning no one has been free and clear of sin except for the Son of Man. And he said, the only way you're going to be able to enter into heaven, in verse 14, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And the only way to get free from sin is belief in Jesus. The same is true for all of us. No matter how much, of our, li how much our life is put together, no matter how much our life is going great, no matter how much our life seems awesome, we have sin. We fall short of what Jesus and God has and wants for our life. See, God loves you. God cares for you. But if we do not look to Jesus, no matter how great our life is, no matter how wonderful and awesome our life is, we're going to miss out on his greatest gift of all. But some of you may be saying, well, wait. I mean, how can I have sin? I don't feel guilty about anything that I do, about anything in my life. And if I'm doing something wrong, I mean, wouldn't I feel guilty about doing something wrong? Wouldn't that be so? I'd, I'd feel bad about it, right? I want to read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, um, and this is what it says there. It says, they are darkened in their understanding and are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Um, I'll explain that in just a second. I just, this was written by Paul, this letter to the Ephesians. Paul wrote this. Uh, Paul, at one point in his life, he was a Pharisee, just like Nicodemus. Um, he wrote this letter as an encouragement to the church, and this is what he's saying with this verse. He's saying, look, some of you have grown up in an environment, or you live in an environment where you're separated from God, where God isn't part of your everyday activities, where he's not a part of your everyday life. And because of that, it's made you ignorant. Now, Paul is not saying you're an ignorant fool. He's not saying you're stupid. I mean, ignorance basically means um, that it, you lack knowledge, you lack information, you lack awareness. That's all ignorance means. And, and Paul is saying that, you know what, your lack of knowledge, your lack of information has caused a hardening in your heart. You don't understand these things. You don't know these things. You don't, you don't know about sin. And so when sin comes along and you do it in your life because it's not there in your heart and your mind, you just don't know. Your heart is hard because you've just been separated from God, living your life apart from him. It's not a statement that you're an idiot. It's a statement that says why we don't feel guilty about the sin that we commit. I mean, this is the way I was before Jesus. I didn't feel guilty about any of the lifestyle that I lived. Didn't feel guilty at all. I didn't walk around wringing my hands going, oh, man, I keep offending a holy God. Never once did that thought cross my mind, ever, ever, okay? That was not the thought on my head. And the reason was because I'd been around, I'd been separated from God for so long that my conscience just told me that the things that I was doing, that the way that I was living was okay. 
It had seared my conscience. It had hardened my heart towards the things of sin. I mean, that's why, you know, you can see a serial killer get up and they interview him and say, you killed 46 people. Do you feel guilty about it? No, not really. It's just because where he was living at, how he was, how, how he was behaving just burned his conscience. He was so far from God, he just didn't have that soft heart towards those things. And it's the same way with all of us on different levels. We each have a different level that we kind of harden our hearts and don't hear, you know, don't, don't know and don't, don't feel the conviction of God. And Nicodemus in this situation didn't feel guilty for the life he was living. And just like Nicodemus, just like with me, it doesn't matter what your conscience is telling you at the moment, there really is no hope without Jesus. And to illustrate that, you know, Moses, or he tells that story about, about the snakes. And uh, some of you just heard that and said, oh, is this where they break out the snakes in the service? You know, we start dancing around with them. No, that's not, that's not what's going to happen here. Uh, he's talking about an event in the Old Testament when Moses was the leader of the nation of Israel, okay? They were wandering through the desert. They were waiting to enter the promised land, and through a series of crazy events, some serpents, some poisonous snakes got loose in the camp. And they were running around, and they were just all over the place, and they were biting people, and and God said, here's what we're going to do. Moses, make a bronze serpent on a pole. Hold it up. And if anybody gets bit by that snake, if they focus on that snake on a pole instead of on the snakes that are around them on the ground, they will be healed of the snake bite. See, it wasn't, they couldn't just go to the hospital and say, hey, I just need some anti-venin for this snake that just bit me. Okay, they didn't have it back then. You know, your only hope was God back then if you got bit by a snake. And so that's what they do. They build this snake. They build this thing and they hold it up. And some of you are saying, that is the stupidest plan I've ever heard. Because, what, I mean, wouldn't it be far easier for God just to wipe out all the snakes? Okay, they're dead. Psh, and that would be over. Nobody getting bit by snakes anymore, right? Well, see, God did this for a reason. And I want you to think about it. Okay, picture yourself with a snake invasion. There's eastern diamondbacks all over the place. You're standing amongst a million of them. How many of you are in a panic? Okay, yeah, I, I think there's very few people that would be sitting there, oh, this is cool. They're legit, you know. And let's say they're just biting everyone. Everyone's going down with snake bites. We would, we would be, we'd be losing our minds at that point, right? Everybody, you'd be hoping you had a gun, a sword, something to cut some snakes up. Now imagine you're standing there. Okay, okay this is the point. That God was making and having them look at the serpents on the pole is that he needed them to be calm, to focus on the snakes or the the snake on the pole and realize that if they just trusted God, if they just trusted what he was providing, they would be saved from their situation. And see, just like the Israelites in the desert, all of us have been infected with a poison. We have been infected with a poison of sin, and whether we know it, that we have it or not, it is there. We have it whether we feel guilty about how we're living or not. And there is a cure, but it's not the cure we would think it should be. The cure is Jesus crucified on the, f- the cross. And it is the son of God's death that is the anti-venin for the sin that affects our life. See, that's what Jesus told our friend Nicodemus, even though Nicodemus probably didn't think there was anything wrong with him because of how together his life was. I mean, that was the cure for my messed up life that I lived, and that's the cure for everyone else who doesn't have hope that comes from Jesus. But the question becomes, are you going to take the cure, or are you going to go on with poison in your system that will eventually kill you? That's what we all have to think about. And so, Lewis, if you could come on back up. We all have to realize that even if you're standing there and you're looking at your life and you're saying, you know what? Everything's okay. I've got hope because my life is wonderful. I've got hope. Guess what? That hope is not going to last forever. See, the poison of sin will eventually bring us death and bring us to a place where all hope is lost. However, the hope that Jesus offers never ends. 
Jesus offers a hope that continues on through eternity. That's what Jesus was telling Nicodemus in this story. He was saying, you may have hope now, but that hope is not going to continue. There's only one hope that is going to continue beyond this life. You have to be born again. You have to be born of the Spirit. You have to give your life to Jesus. You have to commit your life to him and allow you him to come in and be the ruler, to be the Lord, to be the one who is over your life. And when we do that, he rescues us from that poison that's in our bodies. He rescues us from that poison that gets in there and infects us and messes us up. That's why God sent Jesus. He wanted us to have hope. He wanted us to have hope. And that's what this hope weekend is all about. I hope you enjoyed that message about hope. And if you did, please click the like button below and let us know. And if you have any questions about us here at Fam Church, you can go out to myfamchurch.com and all of your questions will be answered there. And thank you once again for joining us online at Fam Church.